Good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to continue these studies the, on uh, putting the book of Judges on a line. But before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we ask for your Holy Spirit's presence as we study together this morning. We're grateful for the time that we have each morning uh, to open your word together and for the time that we have to study um, throughout the week on our own, and for the way that you help us in our day-to-day -day struggles. We just pray, Lord, for your presence here as we uh, continue to understand uh, what the Book of Judges means to us. I ask that you can be with each person watching these videos, and that you can guide and direct them in their personal lives. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so what we had done yesterday morning was we took the book of Judges and we put the entire book of Judges on a line. And I, from my perspective, they seem to fall into place rather well as far as taking each of the way marks. Now, we do have from uh, Gideon on, I do have in my PowerPoint, I have lines for each of these, but I, I didn't put in the PowerPoint the lines that we had for Othniel. And so I've been trying to go through my videos and find these diagrams and, and put them in my lines, but we've taken a lot of time to go through some of these things. So to find the actual diagrams, it's going to take me a bit of time, um, but we could... Uh, do them again. So the first thing that we had done once we had got through uh, chapter two, and we noticed when we first started studying judges and we got to chapter two, we noticed this connection with 9-11. And uh, we took the position, which is a long time ago, that the judges um, presents the history of this movement from 9-11 to 2023 with connections to April 5th, 2030, but the primary application is to the time that we're in right now. And uh, these were connected with Odilio's and Colin's studies that were seven weeks apart. Colin's study on December 25th, 2021, and Odilio's on February 12th, 2022. Now, what, what we need to do, so when we look at Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, um, we saw this as this message in connection with 9-11, moving through a history up to uh, November 9th, 2019. That is, we could uh, place these in, in this, this history. So... When we look at this judge's line that we drew out, um, what we don't have here is we don't have any dates. So we, we say this is the judge's line, and oops, and we have here the arrival of the first angel, and we would need to place this as what, what date? What date do we have this as? In this judge's line. So we put a date here. Would we not put 9-11? Talked about what I was going to ask. Because what we're taking is that this judge's line is addressing 9-11. Now, in this line, this is the arrival of the first angel. So, so this isn't 1989 because this isn't a bigger line. This is a zoom into 
one of the way marks on the bigger line. And we did address it a little bit, how this works in uh, the study yesterday afternoon, dealing with the lines simply presented, which Heidi thought was a really good study. You found that that, mm -hmm. that, that worked really well for her in understanding what was happening. And I spelled Othniel wrong here. Okay. Um, so when we say that this is 9-11, I mean, we're, we're marking the way mark 9-11 that, that occurred in history. So this is September 11th, uh, 2001. So there's a period of darkness that, that occurred prior to 9-11. And what would be that period of darkness? Because this is about our movement, right? So, I mean, we can mark things dealing with the church there, but, but as far as this movement, so this is a period in which, you know, Jeff is, uh, and, and we could relate this back into looking at um, examining. Are, are we looking at 1989 to 911 being a period of darkness? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a period of darkness in relationship to the judge's line. So that means this reform line that occurs within this movement uh, begins with 911. So, so remember when we were looking at, at the foundation that was being laid by Jeff? I mean, one is we see it was laid correctly. That's what we understand. It was laid correctly. Now, is this true of Miller as well? I would have to think so. Okay. And when we look at um, uh, Millerite history, is there, are there things that are not understood by Miller and the movement? That is, are there reform lines within the line of Miller itself, within the line of Millerite history? Would you restate that, please? In Millerite history, are there other reform lines other than just the whole reform line of the Millerite line? Yes, there... most definitely. So there, are... yeah. So so we can see that. Now, now one of the things we have in in Millerite history, in particular, I mean, when we went back and looked at um, how the foundation was laid, we could see that. Um, as they as that line progressed, because there is a period of darkness that precedes 1798, and then there is this increase of knowledge, and we could see that there was a personal reform line for Miller. Uh, we could probably even take some of the other pioneers and see that there's personal reform lines for them. Uh, and and with Miller's, I mean, it would start with his birth. Um, and, and, and probably that's where most personal reform lines really start. Uh, we might have other reform lines within them. Uh, but, you know, all of us are born at some time or other. And prior to us being born, we're in a period of darkness uh, in our mother's womb. And, and then we have an increase of light and knowledge. Right? So that happens for all of us per personally. And so we wouldn't normally mark, um, I mean, we might say, well, you know, my conversion is where I would, would mark my, uh, you know, there's a period of darkness before that and afterwards. And that's true. But that would be another personal reform line within our line of our life. Right. So, so we can see that there's these multiple reform lines. And what we don't want to do is... Um, 
you know, become confused by this, that we can see that, that these reform lines, um, they're, they're characteristic of being sort of these wheels within wheels is a necessary characteristic. And, and it comes from the whole creation of the world. So we can clearly see that, you know, there's seven days of creation, um, that they, that they are preceded by a period of darkness, that we have this increase of light, all these things occur. And then finally we have uh, the end, which is the seventh, which is the rest or the Sabbath or uh, the, the millennium, however we look at it, all of these have to do with these, these lines that is God's dealing with man. So it's just a natural uh, progression. It's not something that's artificial. And so the fact that we can see these in nature, that we can see these in history, that we can see these in, in the scriptures so clearly marked out, shows God's design and purpose. So I don't want to get very philosophical here, but uh, one of the things that we, um, one of the things that we see is, is that, I mean, we can talk about this darkness as darkness, but it's also chaos or disorder, Right? And that in Isaiah chapter 28, when it talks about precept upon precept, a precept is to set something in order. And when we are converted, uh, when we have a reform line, God is ordering things or organizing things just as he did at creation. So hopefully that's not too philosophical. Um. But this order leads to something um, that we don't fully understand. So living in this world of sin, what do we understand about this world of sin? I mean, that's a really broad question. But think about uh, the law of the first law of thermodynamics, the law of, of en entropy. What is it that we always experience? That that persists uh, from prior to create, you know, to God saying, "Let there be light." I know it's it's a rather vague question, but what is it that we experience every day? That, that we're always fighting. Battle against the flesh. Battle okay. against the flesh. Okay, against the flesh, but, but against sin. But if we look at it in the sense of what darkness is, and, the, you know, the earth was without form and void, we could call this chaos. We wanted to use a word like that. And that the world tends to disorder, doesn't it? Everything breaks down. You know, you can move into a new apartment building and it's all nice and new. Uh, but I tell you, it doesn't stay nice and new, right? Things break down. You buy a new car, it's not going to last forever. Our bodies break down, right? So one thing we notice in this world is that everything tends to disorder, correct? Right. And so we're very used to living in this world. But we're going to have a time where there is no more disorder. And we have a hard time imagining what heaven would be like. Because we live in this time between darkness and when God, who is light, dwells with us. Correct? Agreed. So we're moving to something that we can't understand. Um. Now, there are people who believe that, you know, we need chaos in order in order for life to exist and that, you know, this idea of heaven is just um, something to strive towards, but something that we never will reach. So I'm saying I'm getting a little bit philosophical here, but 
I don't believe that that's the case. I believe that, that what we are used to, uh, we can understand. But to understand God's kingdom and his purpose, his ultimate purpose for us, is something that's beyond human imagining and that can only be understood uh, through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Would you agree with me there? Amen. Oh, okay. So, you know, so the world doesn't, I mean, in a sense, the world desires what God is offering, but it also uh, does not want to have what God is offering. Okay. Oh, this didn't work. That's because I clicked. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so when we're dealing with this reform line and we're dealing with this darkness, so I just wanted to address that darkness a little bit. Uh, we know that darkness exists all through human history. And that God is bringing us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so the idea that somehow there's this period of darkness, all of a sudden there's this light, there's no more darkness, we know that's not the case. When we go through Millerite history, there's this progression of light that occurs. And so we can have this, this overall reform line that we call Millerite history from 1798 to October 22nd, 1844. But there are other reform lines within that line. And one of them, you know, we mark here, which is Jotham, uh, which we, we align with Samuel Snow um, when we put it into, to our, into the history of the Millerites. And when we put it into our history, we align it with this movement. And we know that Snow's line, the line of his letters, occurs after August 11th, 1840, and prior to April 19th, 1844. And those two waymarks in our line are marked as 9-11. And so they serve two different purposes, or 9-11 serves two different pur purposes because we're on a different line. So 9-11 is one thing in one line and one thing in another. And what Jeff didn't notice when he came to understand that 9-11 was not only August 11th, 1840, but also April 19th, 1844, the arrival of the second angel. So it was both the empowerment of the first angel and the arrival of the second, is he just brought the two together, but he was actually addressing two different lines. And he just didn't know that at the time because we didn't have that understanding. But now we can see that a, a way mark in one line can be a way mark in another. So uh, is that understood well? Are people still unclear about that? Because we've, we've spent, well, over a year on understanding these lines and we've seen it. We may not be able to discern and separate out all of those lines yet, but can we at least see that these lines um, work in this way? Is that clear to everyone? If I don't hear an answer, then I assume that it is. Now, of course, to people on the internet um, who may be watching these, and not everybody's watched every video, um, this idea may not be completely clear. But that's one of the things that we, we want to be able to make clear. So uh, when I was going back, as I mentioned, over these different diagrams that I had here, we had um, these different lines marked out, uh, Gideon uh, specifically marked out. Uh, we, um, I drew lines of Tola and Jair and Jephthah. Um, some of these lines I drew out in much more detail than others, and I, we're going to have them drawn out. So what we want to have with the judge's line is each of the lines for each of these. Now, what we originally were doing uh, was something to this effect. That is, we were drawing out these lines and we, we would show that Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar um, were the lines from basically 
9-11 to, um, to some point in the history of our lines. But they are complete lines in and of themselves, though these are somehow all connected. And then Deborah and Barack, we, we drew out as a line. But what we didn't really have is, uh, we didn't have a complete line like this. We weren't drawing out all the lines nice and neatly like this, which we, we still have to do. Uh, Gideon's line, we did. Um, and, um, you know, definitely Samson, we spent a lot of time dealing with the line of Samson. But we weren't always exactly following this pattern. That is, we didn't really complete all of these lines the way that we should have. Um, but partly that was because I don't think we really understood um, what we were doing. That is, we, we had a partial idea of what we're doing, but we didn't fully understand this. And I think it's becoming a bit clearer now. So first thing that we would do with this judge's line is we would have to see that these lines fit within our history. They begin at 9-11 and they address uh, errors that existed which are messages and the judges themselves are messages that shed light upon that error. That is, it's a reform line that corrects us from a particular error. So that I think we're clear about. So getting back to the darkness here, right? So we took a little bit of a detour around there, but to get back to this darkness here, what particularly is this darkness in the movement that precedes 9-11. What is it that the movement did not understand prior to 9-11? But let's put it that way. So let's let's address what this is. What was Jeff thinking? What was his understanding? Because God gave him light. So we're not saying that he's in darkness in the sense of um, you know, total chaos or anything like that, because he has a reform line that he's a part of himself. So what's the darkness here? There's a number of things that we can mark. Mark. Okay, I'll ask more specific questions. What was Jeff's understanding of the role of the Seventh-day Adventist Church prior to 9-11? How was he thinking of the lines? Prior to 9-11, didn't wasn't his, his focus that this was Laodicea? Okay, so so when he's looking at the church, is he even talking about the Seventh-day Adventist church as being passed by? I don't believe initially, no. This is actually going to be after 9-11 that he's going right. to talk in that way. So what he sees is what many Seventh-day Adventists would have seen in the 1990s. We know that the church is in apostasy. The organizational structure is not following God's counsel. Um, and in my understanding, I saw that what happened in the 70s with Pearson was an attempt at reforming Adventism. And I became an Adventist, you know, December 25th, 1982. So I, you know, I was converted uh, as a Christian during um, uh, Glacier View. So on August 11th, and Glacier View had started, uh, I think, the day before that and ended on August 15th, uh, 1980. So, so we see that there's this uh, watershed part of Adventist history moving into the 1980s. Uh, but there still is um, a point which we call the time of the end, and that's going to be the fall of the Berlin Wall on November 9th, and uh, marking the beginning of the fall of the Soviet Union. And the Adventist Church is not going to recognize this as a prophetic fulfillment, even though... Louis F. Weir had predicted this event, right? 
Right. So, so Adventism uh, is now in the in this this period of darkness, and light has come to them, and they're going to reject that light. And but then we come to nine eleven. So nine eleven is another prophetic event. And and the one of the things I think about when I think about nineteen eighty nine and nine eleven is. Uh, Donald Trump, when he's at NATO, and this is in 2017, and when they had the new NATO building built, uh, they had uh, on the one side of him a, um, a portion of the Berlin Wall, and on another side, um, one of the girders from the Twin Towers. And and he mentions these two events in, in in a profound prophetic way, whether he understood it fully or not. But we understand that these two events are are fundamental to our line, right? I mean, and and yet these prophetic events have been rejected by the Adventist Church. Now, in some ways, 9-11 wasn't really foreseen by this movement, though I do believe that um, the groundwork was laid for it to understand 9-11. Um, and we can, what, what Jeff is foreseeing, what Jeff is predicting is what event, what event is Jeff interested in prior to 9-11? Primarily the Sunday law. The Sunday law. And then what about this repeat of Millerite history? What, what does he understand the necessity of this repeat of Millerite history is for? Why, why is he emphasizing this? Even though he's talking about the Sunday law, why is he looking at Millerite history? Didn't that have to have more to do with an understanding of the seven thunders? Okay, so there's an understanding of the seven thunders. So he knows that there's, he doesn't fully understand the seven thunders, right? Because he takes them as being events in Millerite history uh, that are repeated in our history, though we understand now that those events in Millerite history, these seven way marks that we see, um, that in our history, they're unsealed. And they're unsealed as we walk through our lines as we go through our lines, and so when they're first looking at millerite history they do they understand the first day of the first month the fifth day of the fourth month the first day of the fifth month do they understand those in relationship to a line because remember jeff's line is pretty simple no he i don't think he understood that no, not at all right so we, we don't even understand millerite history prior to 9-11, he is going to have 1989 as the parallel to August 11th, 1840. So obviously he's not lining it up with 9-11. Um, and, and he's looking to the Sunday law, that the Sunday law is imminent. And, and, and so his way marks are um, just simply 1989 lines up with 1798 right so he has this time of the end so he's going to have the time of the end and he's going to have the sunday law as the next way mark in his line and then that will be followed by the close of probation so the close of probation lines up with october 22 1844 so it's a very simple line three way marks that he looks at in in Millerite history. And so the Sunday law itself, which he's looking for, he doesn't, so where would that line up in Millerite history? So he's got three way marks. He's got the time of the end, the Sunday law, the close of probation. And so how does he line those up with Millerite history? Close of probation is gonna be October 22. Right. So where's where does he have the Sunday law in connection with? Doesn't he place that just somewhere before October twenty second? 
Well, he's, well, he's going to be somewhere before, but specifically, he's going to pl place it in in um, 1842, right? Because what he's looking at is he's looking at the parallel of what happens with the Protestants in their rejection of the first angel's message. And he's going to line that up loosely somehow. And, and you know, it's it, it changes a little bit as he moves along. But, you know, the Protestants close their door, right? So he's looking at this as um, a type of close of probation that happens for Seventh-day Adventists in connection with the Sunday law. So the close of probation itself, the for the world, he lines up with October 22, 1844. Now, this is based upon Ellen White uh, saying that uh, the midnight cry parallels the loud cry. So, and, and the loud cry she has after the Sunday law. So Jeff is going to look at the events that, that lead to, and, you know, from May or June of 1842 up until the end of Miller's prediction. So the first disappointment, which he has is March 21st, incorrectly. Um, and that's sort of going to be the parallel with the Sunday law. It's going to be this the arrival of the second angel's message, right? So he's going to have the arrival of the second angel's message there. Babylon has fallen. And he's going to see that, that that's going to be true at the Sunday law. And then there will be this loud cry that parallels the midnight cry. And then we have the close of probation for the world. So that's the very simple line that he has. But then 9-11 occurs. And again, it takes them time to sort through what 9-11 meant. Now, we have understood then that in Ellen White's line where she sees Revelation 18 as uh, the Sunday law, but we now, now, so Jeff had seen that Revelation 18 also would be the Sunday law, right? So prior to 9-11, Jeff is not saying, you know, that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 had come down, right? He's looking for that to occur at the Sunday law, correct? Agreed. He's just like Alan White, but he knows that there's this repeat of history. And so when 9-11 occurs, it takes them a little while, you know, a couple of years, to really sort out what 9-11 meant and to even see that this is a parallel to August 11th, 1840. So to move the way mark from uh, 1989 as a parallel with August 11th, 1840. And to move it to 9-11 took some time because he had established this waymark and now he had to move it. And of course, people start leaving the movement because of these changes that are occurring. Now, of course, people come into the movement because of 9-11. So 9-11 becomes, um, for Seventh-day Adventists who have been, like Jeff, you know, looking for the com coming Sunday law like i was in the 90s and then we see 9 11 occur it takes us time to sort out what it is now i was early directed to uh, testimonies 9 page 11 uh, whatever it's called the final crisis or the last crisis um and seeing that there was a parallel there with what ellen white was saying about the buildings in new york and what happened at 9 11 so so people start to wake up there. Now, so this period of darkness here has to be um, partly a misapprehension of the lines, right? So it's not necessarily, you know, like sin or something in this movement. It's just the fact that we don't understand some things. And 9-11 comes and marks for this movement a time of the end that we never really recognized it as such but jeff eventually had said you know that the time of the end you know for the priests was going to be 1989 and then for levites it would be 9 11 that would be their time of the end but we never really saw that this would be a time of the end for the movement itself that this is a reform line within the movement we were looking at this as being a reform line 
within Adventism. So how do we address that problem that this movement needs it's, itself needs a reform line? Can we parallel this, this to Millerite history? I would almost think we'd have to. Yeah. And, and we can see that in Millerite history, uh, they were looking for, um, they weren't looking for the Sunday law, right? No, they're looking for the second. Correct. They're looking for the second coming of Christ, but they also are looking for a close of probation. Right. And so we address that uh, in the study in the afternoon, um, which we have addressed before. But the idea was that August 11, 1840 was going to be a close of probation because they expected not just that Jesus was going to come back, um, but there was. And, and, and this idea of the close of probation, I mean, if you read what Millerites are writing, I mean, this is really um Which, which I find to Adventism is kind of a unique idea, but definitely it was well established within the Millerite movement prior to 1840, that there would be a close of probation prior to the second coming. And that this close of probation would be, uh, you know, occur at the end of the sixth trumpet prior to the seventh trumpet beginning to sound, because it's gonna begin to sound there and that there would be the seven last plagues, all these different things that, that we understand now that we have connected to the close of probation to the second coming. So the Millerites had all of these ideas well established prior to 1840. Um, so when we lined up 9-11 with August 11th, 1840, um, and we saw we could see then that there is a close of probation there for the Seventh-day Adventist church on some level, right? But we also have 9-11 being April 19th, which is a closed door for the Protestants. So this, this other closed door, I mean, these wheels within wheels um, can appear complex at first, but we know that, that they have a perfect order And that what the Millerites were passing through was typical history. Can, can we say that safely? That their experience in the unfolding of light to them was typical of our time. I would think so. I, I would think we have to believe that based upon a repeat of history. We can't just say, you know, this whole line of the Millerites and without looking at the details, somehow parallels our history, without understanding what those parallels are. So, so we need to understand them. I mean, if we're going to understand our time, we need to understand the, 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 the primary template uh, for all of these lines, which is Millerite history. I mean, we can see that you know, we go back to creation, we can see that it typifies our lines as well. But the line that was given to us as the template, as the model by which to compare all other lines is Millerite history. You can take the 23rd Psalm as Chawatu did, and you can see these parallels. We can go through even the reform line of the three decrees, which parallels Millerite history. But none of these, these lines are understood without a reference to Millerite history because Millerite history is the template that was given to us, correct? I would say yes. And that this came to us in the unsealing of the seven thunders. Right, the unsealing of Millerite history. This is a very profound truth that I don't think we, we completely appreciate or fully appreciate of what our experience has been in this movement in understanding Millerite history. Because as we passed through these, these waymarks, 
the thunders were unsealed. And can we say that those thunders are unsealed? Do we do we believe that we completely understand Millerite history now? You know, in its main aspects. With that qualifier, I would I would think that we understand it in its main aspects, but we have a lot more yet to understand. Right. So so we understand the seven thunders, in, in my understanding. We we do. Now there are a lot of details that still uh, have unfolded, but we've we've understood Samuel Snow's letters. We've understood the details regarding um the dates, you know, the fifth day of the fourth month and the first day of the fifth month, and even have a greater understanding of what happened at Boston and what happened at Exeter, because those two waymarks, which are a doubling of a single waymark, um, had been conflated within uh, Adventist understanding. That is the events that happened at Boston in July, Loughborough had thought occurred in Exeter, and so he talks about this Exeter camp meeting in July in which Samuel Snow rides up on a horse, et cetera. And, and he, he just didn't realize these were two different events. And, and so those details, which no eyewitness gives as happening at Exeter about Samuel Snow riding up on a horse, et cetera, and giving that question and answer uh, session, which could, would only make sense at Boston. Uh, Adventism has been in the dark regarding Millerite history and appears to continue to be in the dark regarding Millerite history. I mean, you can pretty much be assured if you were to sit down with almost any Seventh-day Adventist, no matter how much they're educated in Millerite history, professors and so forth, if you were to lay out when things in Millerite history occurred in relationship to uh, the calendar and, you know, what events occurred at Boston, what events occurred at Exeter, and given them the timing of these events, I would guarantee you that none of them know this information. This is something unique to this movement, correct? Most assuredly, yes. So, I mean, it's, it's a very profound truth that we understand Millerite history. And further, our understanding of Millerite history in connection with 457 BC is unique to this movement. No one else that I know of has ever understood that relationship. The Millerites had a slight understanding of it in the sense that they understood the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month. Um, but they didn't know that the first day of the fifth month was August 15th, 1844, right? So they definitely didn't, didn't see this. And, and we can be very assured that the chiastic structures that exist within 457 BC, pointing out Pentecost and the Day of Atonement, that that is unique to this movement, right? That's, nobody else knows about this that we have ever seen. I've never found any evidence that anybody on the internet has ever addressed these points. And even within this movement, I don't think many people understand that um, or even seem to care about it, right? So if we were to ask people in this movement about that, that uh, parallel from 457 BC and these chiasms, I would say that very few people in this movement would even know about that unless they've spent time in the studies that we've done. And these are very profound truths, right? Huge. So, yeah, so this movement has been in darkness prior to 9-11. And what we see is that 9-11 is a time of the end. And, and the time of the end, remember, normally when we have a time of the end, we have a, a time prophecy that marks the time of the end. 
Now, that has always been for me one of the biggest struggles I've had with 9-11, not just marking it as the time of the end, because I never did at first. But the biggest problem I had with 9-11 is I could not find a chronological connection between 9-11 and August 11th, 1840, or October 22, 1844. That is, I could not take 9-11 and find some kind of of structure. Now we could with 1989, right? We could take, um, well, we could take 1863 and see the 126 years, but we don't have anything like that for 9-11, right? No, we don't. Okay. And so, so that's something that always troubles me, so to speak, because I spent a lot of time looking at these structures in the past in prophetic prophecy. And, and sure, we could mark 1989. But, you know, I had something for August 11th, 1840 in Millerite history right, as this major way mark. We have something for April 19th. And then we have structures that come from the book of Ezekiel and 457 BC that can help us mark the fifth day of the fourth month and the first day of the fifth month. So all of those things could be readily marked. Now, the way that 9-11 now, that I understand it, had to do with its connection that we saw here in the book of Judges. And that is the connection of 9-11 being the first day of the first month in its connection to the 20th day of the ninth month, right? That is, if we take the story, and, and also to the first day of the first month, but if we take the story of Ezra 7 to 10, and we, we, we connect it first to Millerite history, we can also connect it to our history. But we've only done this through the book of Judges. Right. Without the book of Judges, we wouldn't really have been able to see um, these structures that exist and their connection to the first day of the first month, which we mark as April 5th, 2030. And we, with the April 5th, 2030 date, we can now connect the first day of the first month in our line by applying a day for a month. Right. So we've gone through this before. But do we see how important it is to understand that 9-11 is the first day of the first month? In Millerite history, it parallels that. But that we can't really establish it without this understanding that we've gained from the Book of Judges. Do we see that? I would say yes. Okay. Now, if 9-11 is the first day of the first month and parallels both Millerite history and 457 BC, when we look at the darkness in 457 BC, that's going to precede that. So that means if we're going to take the line of, of, of Ezra beginning on the first day of the first month, which is going to be um, April 26th, uh, 457 BC, when he's going to leave Babylon. That period of, of darkness, what is it? For, for Ezra. I know we never asked this question before. We never discussed it. But mustn't there be a period of darkness for Ezra if he's a reform line? There has to be. Now, when, when we look at Nehemiah, we, we, we have that clearly marked 
to Nehemiah, right? So Nehemiah has, you know, this sorrow over the fact that the city, the walls in, the, in Jerusalem haven't been built, that Jerusalem isn't really established. The temple has been rebuilt, but, but Jerusalem is insecure, right? So Nehemiah is going to go back. He's going to be built the streets and the walls. And he's also going to address the Sabbath, which is a parallel to the walls, right? The repair of the breach. Right. The store of paths to dwell in. If I take away thy foot from the whole, from, um, the, you know, the Sabbath, we call the Sabbath a delight, the Holy of the Lord, all honorable. Right? So we can see that um, Nehemiah is addressing the Sabbath. But it's not really quite clear, I think, even to... Um, Ezra, that really this period of a darkness addresses something within Jerusalem itself to those who have come to Jerusalem under Cyrus's decree and Darius's decree, and that is the marriage to the strange wives. Would we agree with that? Agreed. Okay. And so, so this marriage to the strange wives and, and to what's happening in Jerusalem, even though it's not explicitly set out in why Ezra is leaving, right? Why, why even that Artaxerxes issues his decree is, is not detailed in the same, same way that it is in the story of Nehemiah, right? So when we look at, uh, we're going to go there here. So when we go to the story of Ezra, let's start here. So, so one of the things you see in chapter six, this is going to be Darius's decree. They're going to celebrate the Passover. That's how it's going to end. And then we go to chapter seven. And it says just now after these things in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sarai, right? It goes on with his genealogy. This Ezra went up from Babylon. He was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. So in the Bible itself, it's not going to tell us much about why Ezra is, what his motivations are. Right? Now he's going to be um, bringing priests, Levites, singers, porters, Nethanim, right? Uh, and he's going to do this in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king, and he's going to come to Jerusalem in the fifth month, in the seventh year of the king, and he's going to begin on the first day of the first month, and he's going to arrive on the first day of the fifth month that he arrives in Jerusalem, right? And so we know all of this, and then it's going to be all about setting up this this decree is setting up the civil authority. It does make mention about you know basically decorating uh, the sanctuary, some offerings for the sanctuary from Artaxerxes, but the purpose of this decree is primarily uh, civil, right? He's gonna set up these judges and magistrates and they're going to have, and that's gonna be in verse 25. But thou Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. And whosoever will not do the law of God and the law of the king, that judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death, or to banishment, or confiscation of goods, or to imprisonment. So this is going to be the setting up of the symbol of th civil authority, um, which is you know, not something we usually address. We look at, oh, he's going to provide things to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And so as a Seventh-day Adventist, I always believe that Artaxerxes' decree had to do with building the temple. And, you know, and then he's going to have the second decree in his 20th year that's going to be building the streets and walls, not knowing that the temple had already been built, you know, 59 years before. Um, and, you know, not understanding that history at all, even though it's in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Um, you know, clearly marked out how these things unfold but just not understanding it. And, and this is pretty common in Adventism. 
We just don't understand uh, the end of the Babylonian captivity or the three decrees. So, so this is a kind of darkness that we have. But what, so what we don't have here is specifically why Ezra is doing this. I mean, we can we can assume some things, and Ellen White uh, addresses this a little bit, but it's not the same as Nehemiah. And so in our minds, we just kind of just fill in the blanks of things that aren't there. But, but we can see that in the period of darkness that, that is occurring in the line of Ezra, which you know, right now we're looking at the judge's line. But we can see that there's a period of darkness because this first day of the first month here represents Millerite history, but it also represents um, um, the story of Ezra because he does leave on the first day of the first month. So there are some things about these lines and the ways that they interact with each other and the ways in which they're laid down uh, that is extremely important for us to understand. Now, the other thing about Ezra's line that we then know is that it's actually the third decree, right? Now, in this third decree, we have a reform line, but we know that the time of the end in the, the story of the decrees has to do with Cyrus, right? Cyrus is going to be um, to become the king of Babylon with the death of his uncle Darius. And, and so that's going to happen in the fall of 537 BC. And then, and then Cyrus himself is going to issue a decree um, in that history. So here in the third decree, we actually have another reform line. So we can see that we can look at these decrees, but there is a de there's a reform line in the time of Cyrus. There's a reform line in the time of Darius. There's a reform line in the time of Ezra. And there's also a reform line in the time of Nehemiah. Each one of these are a reform line. They're illustrating the same history, right? Millerite history, right? They're all illustrating the same thing, even though they're in different histories. They illustrate Millerite history, and they also illustrate our time. So, so if we were looking at this line as being the line of Ezra, we would see that there's a period of darkness, which has to do with the lack of civil authority that is occurring in Jerusalem, because that's what's going to be addressed in the decree itself. But that civil authority is going to be exercised its application is going to be regarding the divorce that's going to go from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month, ending that year. So I think this is pretty profound, you know, how we understand these lines. So now when we look at the judge's line, we know that our history is paralleling 457 BC or 457 BC is paralleling our history because we can take the line of Ezra and we can place it over our line. But that's going to go from 911 to basically 2030 if we're, we're, we're going to address that whole thing, right? April 5th, 2030 at least. But we know that also 9-11 represents what in our history. So, so we can go back to 9-11 and we can say 9-11 is 2001, but 9-11 is also November 9th, 2019 as well, right? Do we understand that clearly? Because we have wheels within wheels, right? Right. And so, uh, and we saw that when we were going through the judges, that 9-11 that is part of this structure. But we have this other line, which is this 777 structure. And this 777 structure um, 
What we haven't fully developed is the relationship of Samuel Snow, his line, um, to, to our line, and also to 457 BC. Now we see we see the echoes of Samuel Snow in 457 BC, and how do we see that? This might be a, a pretty technical question that most people can't answer. But what do we primarily primarily think when we think of Samuel Snow as what what did he do? What did he give us, Samuel Snow, in history, in Millerite history? What did he give us? Okay, I'll ask the question a little bit differently. So William Miller believed that Jesus was crucified when? Okay, so Rand says the midst of the week, and that's true. So, so Miller believed that Jesus was crucified at the end of the 70th week, right? Correct. Uh, in... AD 33, and he counted that from the 12th day of the first month when Ezra left the river Ahava, because he calls that the going forth of the commandment, and he wanted Jesus to be crucified 490 years later to the day on the 12th day of the first month in 33 AD. That is, Miller did not have Jesus crucified on Passover. He had him crucified two days before Passover, which makes no sense to me whatsoever, but that's what he believed. And he wasn't challenged on that, that I can find, uh, by his opponents or by people within the movement itself, which I, I find extremely remarkable because we're just so used to understanding uh, some of these things. But it wasn't challenged. It wasn't questioned. Uh but Samuel Snow comes along and he gives us the midst of the week, showing that Jesus is crucified in 31 AD. And uh, so this is, is pretty clear and profound light. So he gives us this chiasm, and it's published on May 2nd in 1844 in the Midnight Cry. And that's going to be exactly halfway between his writing of his first um, article and the publication of his last article prior to midnight. So, and, and we know it's also going to be Passover, right? So he's going to write a letter. It's going to be published on May 2nd. We don't know when he wrote it. It's going to be published on May 2nd. It's going to be addressing the midst of the week which of course occurs on Passover, not on the 12th day of the first month. And he's, it's published on Passover. And, and it's in the middle, it's, a, it's the center of a chiasm. So he's talking about a chiasm, that the 70th week has a chiasm. He doesn't use that word, but he's describing it. And it's published in the center of a chiasm. And then Samuel Snow, is going to present this message in Boston, right? So this is gonna be three days after uh, his last letter is published. And, and he's going to say that he's in the center of a chiasm. He doesn't call it that, but he's gonna be in the middle of that period of time from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month, right? So he's gonna be at midnight. The fifth day of the fourth month is the date that that occurs. And that, that's going to be demonstrated in the line of Ezra, because when he leaves on the 12th day of the first month and arrives on the first day of the fifth month, so he leaves the river Ahava, the center of that is going to be uh, 54 days from when he left the river Ahava and 54 days 
to when he gets to Jerusalem. And that 54 days represents the fifth day of the fourth month. Now, it's an inclusive count of 108 days, but it's a cardinal count of 107 days, which represents the 10th day of the seventh month. So, so we can see this intertwining of these chiastic structures and the symbols that exist within them uh, are extremely profound. And the fifth day of the fourth month, of course, also occurs in Ezekiel. And Ezekiel's gonna, his last date that's mentioned in Ezekiel is going to be the 10th day of the seventh month. So we can tie Ezekiel uh, to Ezra, to Millerite history, to Snow, to Snow's letters in these very profound ways. So we know that we have these reform lines uh, and with these messages that have these structures and, and these are being zoomed into different way marks. So this is what we're understanding and we're, we're struggling to get this into our heads so that we can see the whole picture. And the book of Judges has been a tremendous amount of light as far as understanding our lines. And we can agree with that. But we don't fully understand everything, right? We haven't put it all together completely. We have these pieces of the puzzle that we've examined and we can see them quite clearly, but we don't know how they all fit. <clears throat> So now we're going to just take this to our history. We're going to look at this first day of the first month. So we know this first day of the first month, that is the first angel arriving after a period of darkness. In our history, it is a lack of understanding of what specifically now. Okay, just as Ezra didn't fully understand the period of darkness prior to him leaving uh, Babylon, when we get to 9-11, do we fully understand what the problem is within this movement? Okay, so we have an increase of knowledge, and, and that increase of knowledge is going to be formalized where? So we're, we're looking at our line. This is our history. We have 9-11. That's the time of the end. We have the spirit of darkness, which we haven't clearly defined, but we're going to have this formalization of the message. Where? Do we know yet? Wouldn't that be about 2005? Okay, so you're looking at this line a little differently than I am, okay? So, I mean, we can say that. So, but, but you're looking at the formalization because we're, we're looking at the period of darkness. And so if we're going to look at a message that's formalized, we would compare this to, you know, 1833. So there's a message that has been developed that we're now giving, Right. And it relates to the darkness that had preceded it. And it's something within this movement. So we're not looking at the bigger line of, of things, right? We're looking at a reform line within this movement itself, where the time of the end is marked as 9-11. Well, there's another thing that you had addressed, I believe, yesterday that we needed to, to also consider. Because in the, in the Millerite line, where do we come to midnight? 
we've already established the the timing of the midnight cry, but how do we establish midnight as well? Uh, right. Okay. So, so you can see some of the complexities, right? We we want to know where midnight is. Well, this is this is very complex. Yeah, it is complex. It's not an easy thing to address. But see, I'm looking at this period of darkness and I'm saying this is one reform line that the judge's line is showing us. Now, we're going to be addressing errors. And so we have this increase of knowledge. But now we're going to have this, this formalization of a message. And what if I put 2018 here? Because we know Deborah and Barack is going to be addressing Parminder, right? Correct. Okay. And, you know, I mean, we could put maybe, you know, there's a reform line here. But um, the formalization of a message that we're, we're addressing right now in this movement has to do with time. And in 2018... Um, Tess is going to introduce November 9th, 2019, right, as a date. But in connection with that, we're going to see this um, 391 days. So I'm, I'm going to say, and I could even be more specific, I could say October 13th, 2018. And then I can take this and say that if we have 391 days that this would be 11.9 because that's going to be what I count from October 13th I'll do this 2018 is that 391 days and the, the first angels empowered in Millerite history at the end of 391 years and 15 days, right? Half a month, 0.5. So we get a 391.5 there. Now, then we're going to have... Um, this is going to be... Um, right? In this line, right? It's the arrival of the second angel's message. In this line specifically. Right? Because this line is addressing um, our history, specifically our history having to do with time. Is this making sense to people? And, and we know that Jotham represents Samuel Snow's letters, right? So he's going to be representing uh, a development of light that's going to be, uh, if we compare it to Millerite history, you know, before... Uh, you know, after, I guess we would say after, um, you know, August 11th, 1840, and then before, um, you know, so between August 11th, 1840, and April 19th, 1844. So he's going to have this light that's going to be developed. Right. So that's when he begins. Now, this is just a suggestion. But, you know, if we were going to follow this through, we would have, um, what would we have here? As the formalization of this message of July 18, 2020. Would it be December 6th? Okay. Of 2020? Yeah, so...
Okay, so we put it December 6, 2020. Okay, so that's what we'll do here. Now, why would we put the formalization there in the message of Jephthah? Because we're going to have to examine this in more detail as we go through each of these lines. Why would we put it there? Well, the reason I brought that up is that as, as you're looking at this line, you have the next major event occurring took place on December 6th. Okay. Yeah. And, and so, so that's definitely possible, but we know we have to, we have to fit this line in and, and we'd have to look at Jeff and see how it would relate to that. Um, Definitely, Jephthah is in response to those events of December 6, 2020. Now, why do we say that? Because what, what's Jephthah about? It's a conflict between with Ephraim, right? Right. It's a conflict within the movement, technically. Right. So it's a conflict within the movement. Now, now this conflict is within the movement. Of course, we can see that it, it comes to a head here on December 6, 2020, but it still continues, right? So it's not going to be uh, completed there. That is many of the people who are in the movement still have this have sympathize with uh, the declaration that was delivered on December 6, 2020. Now, now is it the first conflict with the, between um, a judge and Ephraim? It's the second, right? Because remember, there's going to be the conflict that happens with Ziba and Zalmunna. in the story of Gideon as well. And, and the way that we understand this then, the way that we understood it before, is there's a conflict that happens here at 11.9, right? And that's with Parminder, correct? Parminder's movement. And can we see that December 6th, they're going to repeat the same message as Parminder. Is that clear to people? So Parminder's rejection of July 18th occurs before July 18th. FFA's rejection of July 18th occurs after July 18th. And so this is a mirror. Can we see that clearly? Hopefully people can. And then we're going to have what here? How does that sit with people? December 25th, 2021.
Is that okay? Anybody have any comments on that? Why would I put December 25th, 2021 there? You can't just let me put things down without commenting on them. Is anybody there? I was called away for a second. Okay. So I put December 25th, 2021 at Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. Right. Now, now, we had, when we looked at each of these as a separate reform line, so, so one of the things we saw that all of these have characteristics of the symbols of our message. Now, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon, they had these characteristic, the main thing that we looked at as a symbol is the, the 7, 10, 8, right? July 18th being represented there. But here I'm gonna put that at December 25th, 2021. I'm not gonna put them over here at July 18th, 2020 even though they have those symbols, but is it uh, proper to place them here? And we can see that their mirror is October 13th, 2018. So why would I put December 25th there? And this one I'm gonna put as something. Just haven't decided yet. Now, this is the 20th day of the ninth month, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Okay. Now, th there was other options. So, initially, before you put December 6th, 2020 there, I was going to put December 25th, 2021 here. Right. And I was going to put... Um, uh, uh, the end of Collins' prediction here, and then I was going to put April first or April fifth, twenty thirty here. Um, but I I could here um, just put uh, the January eleventh, twenty twenty three date here. <clears throat> So, so when we tie this all together, I mean, um, whether this is correct or not, this last part, what are our reasons for putting December 25th, 2021 as connected with the second angel being empowered? I mean, it's the end of our 777 structure. I would just place dates here because we have dates or is there a reason can we connect this in a mirror structure to october 13th 2018 i think we can i think we're going to have to go deeply into the conversation though to do that yeah okay so so we have a number of things as an empowerment we have a recognition by stephen for the first time something that was so obvious we should have seen it before but there's 777 years from 457 BC to uh, 321 AD, which is the Sunday law. And uh, so this becomes a, a real empowerment of our understanding of things in this judge's line, because this is addressing time. 
But we also have Colin's prediction, which is going to end on January 11th, 2023. And so if we say the arrival of the third angel's me message has occurred in our movement, that is, if we parallel this to Millerite history, um, we have this, this, this structure that's pointing, because in Millerite history, that's just the arrival of the third angel's message. And we have this date in the future, which is the first day of the first month. Now, remember, this is uh, the 20th day of the ninth month. And this is a symbol of uh, the first day of the 10th month, right? And how that we, we got this structure, it's connected to, of course, December 25th, 2022 as well. But we established this in the story of Samson. So when we're taking each of these histories, each of these histories has dates in it, which span from either September 11th, 2001, or November 9th, 2019, up to um, the end of this line, or even you know, to 2023, or even to um, April 5th, 2030. Because remember with Ibzan, Elam, and Abdon, we had a symbol that it also had occurred other places in the story of Samson. And that was the 30-30-30 right so correct we're seeing those as the months and we could take that structure and it would lead us to april 5th 2030 so so one of the things we found as we went through the story of the judges is that this this 2023 kept showing up the structure of what was going to be happening and we were passing through this time in a sense as we were doing um these lines, right? So we were, uh, we could see where we were in the line. Every time when we looked at one of these judges, we could see where they, this started and where it was leading to. And it kept leading to 2023. And as we moved into uh, uh, this, the arrival of the section, Tola and Jair, we specifically got more information regarding April 5th, 2030. So each of these reform lines, is going to cover this history. But each of these reform lines themselves, each of these judges are addressing errors that are that are occurring in the way marks that we're placing them. Right? So it it's it's extremely profound, but it is a lot of information uh, especially for me, getting people's names straight and these stories straight. Uh, without the chronological stuff, I would have no idea who any of these people are or what they did. So the chronology really helps me. But we can see this, right? Are people agreed that this is extremely logical and consistent with what we've already understood in the past? The structure is becoming more and more clear. Yeah, and there's this consistency, right, which uh, to me is important, you know, that we're not we're not just coming up with things that, you know, we, we're applying one time one way and one time another way, that we have a reason why we do what we do. And that reason is consistent with what we did in the past in regard to the lines, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and on all the other lines that we've had, Millerite history. And, and that was the problem I had with Parminder's ideas, is it wasn't consistent. It was like a new application of our in our time of lines that didn't really make sense to me, but also just were inconsistent with what we already knew. And so uh, things being consistent, even though they are very complex, because sometimes people make things consistent by just simplifying things. You know, but um, that to me isn't uh, satisfactory. We, we can't just simplify things and, you know, and especially ignore reality. Um, 
yeah, you can make up any sort of pattern and thing and say, well, you know, this is this is what's happening. Um, and that's the problem I have with the subjective nature of some of the interpretations that we've had in the past of our lines. Uh, to me, it just smacks of the same type of uh, subjective um, fantasies that we see in the evangelical world regarding Bible prophecy, like the book of Revelation, just making up stuff as you go. And I don't think that's what we're doing. I think that we're, we've been digging and examining things extremely closely to create these lines. We have not, we've been discovering what is there. We've been doing an archeological dig. We've been cataloging each item, each artifact that we have found, its place and location. And now we are getting a bigger picture of, of, of the site that we're digging in, which is God's word, which is, giving light to the present. Does that make sense to people? It looks logical. Because yeah. people can, you know, find a little, you know, they're out on the beach and they kick their foot in the sand and they find something and they can imagine a whole story about what that, how that item got there. <coughs> but without carefully archeological examination, without cataloging things and marking things, you can just make up any story you want. This is what Parminder was teaching, right? With parable teaching, he was basically saying, you just make up the story and that story is true. And that's nonsense. Right. But that's what he was saying. That you could create your own parables. And, and that's, of course... Uh, logical fallacy that's the uh i can't remember what they call it but it's it's basically uh the the fallacy of analogy just because you can make an analogy doesn't mean something is true my dad used to always do those types of arguments he'd give me some parallel parable of of that supported his argument and i'd say well it's just a parable it doesn't mean anything it's not true. Just because you can make an analogy doesn't mean it's true. But some people believe that. Anyway, so we're going to close with prayer. And we'll approach this again tomorrow. Dear Father in heaven, uh, please be with us throughout this day. Help us to think about these things and um, to continue to study them more deeply. That we can understand them. Be with each person. May your angels watch over us, and may your Holy Spirit continue to speak to us. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.